of Switzerland and Swiss writer Thomas Prügelmann. My name is Nicole Sheehan. I'm the director of the Council for European Studies here at Konoka University and your chair of this afternoon's event. Before I introduce our speaker, I would kindly ask you to please turn off or lower the ring volume on your cell phones to minimize interruption. <laughs> Thank you. And now it is my great pleasure to welcome with you Jürgen Bachloch, who is professor of German at the Department of Germanic Studies of Trinity College, University of Dublin. Jürgen's main research area areas are literature and medicine, science and psychology around 1800, questions of identity in the German-speaking world in Europe, as well as contemporary Swiss literature, topics on which he has published widely. Recent books include Schweiz Schreiben zur Konstruktion und Dekonstruktion des Mythos Schweiz in der Gegenwartsliteratur, published by De Gruyter. From 2002 to 2005, Jürgen was director of the Center for European Studies from 2007 to 2011, Register of the University. From 2012 to 2015, Director of the Trinity Long Room Hub Arts and Humanities Research Institute. And from 2015 to 2018, Head of School of the School of Languages, Literatures, and Cultural Studies. From 2013 to 2018, he led the university-wide interdisciplinary research theme, Identities in Transformation. He is currently Vice Chair of the Executive Board of the Coimbra Group of European Universities. And if that's not impressive enough, <laughs> you also hold the oldest chair of German in the world, which, as the date behind his name indicates, was established in 1776. <coughs> Jürgen is here as the first fellow from Trinity College Dublin under a partnership that will see an annual fellowship exchange between the Society of Fellows at the Heyman Center and the Trinity Long Room Hub Arts and Humanities Research Institute in Trinity College, Dublin. This May, Seamus Khan was the first Columbia scholar who spent a month in Dublin. This exchange is linked to the new dual degree between Columbia and Trinity College, which had its first student intake both here and in Dublin this month, and which is run by the School of General Studies under the leadership of our wonderful Dean, Victoria Rosner, who is also here this afternoon. Now it is my great pleasure to welcome with you Jürgen Bachoff. such a welcoming and stimulating environment. It's great to see the relationship between our institutions strengthened by the day. It's great to welcome some of the Trinity students who are currently here. Um, it's, it's lovely to see you, Victoria. Thank you very much for coming. And it is great to be back in this amazing room. My mind goes back to um, a conference that we had here in November. Uh, it was held partly here and partly in Trinity colleges research institute to sort of uh, get the relationship going. It was a conference with the title Fierce Factions and Fake News, in which we examined the political climate one year after the Brexit decision in Europe and the election of your current president, who I believe is in town today. And we analyzed the threats that right-wing populism, xenophobia, and the coarsening of public discourse pose to the stability of our democracies, to transatlantic relations, and to the post-war European order. These urgent concerns haven't gone away since, quite the opposite, and I decided to pick up some of them with my own talk. As a scholar of the literatures and cultures of the German-speaking world, I thought I would look at an often overlooked aspect, the case of Switzerland. I'm not sure why Switzerland is so little discussed. Perhaps the international disinterest for Switzerland mirrors its self-chosen political isolation as a neutral country outside of NATO, the EU, and the European Economic Area, which only joined the UN in 2002 and rejected joining it with a two-thirds majority as late as 1986. A political isolation that is, of course, in marked contrast to being one of the most globalized countries in terms of its economic and financial flows. 
Perhaps the Swiss special case rhetoric and its much invoked isolationist island metaphor, <laughs> which stems from the First World War, that's actually the parliament in the middle there in Bern, um, but is used until this very day as a neutral and unaffected island of the blessed and a model of stability, security, peace, affluence, and democracy in the midst of a treacherous and threatening ocean and a tsunami of problems and dangers has alienated the international community so much that it decided to leave the Swiss alone. <laughs> Be that as it may, I propose that Switzerland warrants that merits a closer look precisely because we cannot isolate its position and politics from its European and global contexts. We are worried, for example, about recent electoral successes of nationalist anti-immigration parties in Europe. The 12.6% for the Alternative for Deutschland in the German federal elections last autumn in the latest opinion poll last week, the AfD overtook the Social Democrats as, third, as, as, um, as second strongest party at 17%, or the 17.7 for the Lega in Italy, or the 17.5 for the Sweden Democrats a few weeks ago. In Switzerland, the isolationist anti-immigrant Swiss People's Party has been the strongest party in the national parliament in Bern since the early 2000s consistently scoring between 25 and 30 percent of the popular vote. The consequences of its highly controversial and disconcertingly successful policies, especially vis-a-vis -vis immigration and the relationship towards the EU, have been both constrained and empowered by the particularities of the Swiss political system. They have been constrained in that Switzerland has had an all-party government since the 1950s, in which the SVP has had only one or currently two of the seven ministerial positions and is largely bound by the government's consensus style politics. They have been empowered, however, by the, um, in that the SVP has become masterful in using the instruments of Swiss direct democracy, the frequent referenda in which the Swiss people themselves decide on new laws, treaties, treaties with other countries, and all sorts of other political issues by plebiscite. Through this mechanism, the SVP often imposes its policy positions on the country against practically the whole political and economic establishment, and also against its colleagues in the Federal Council. In the run-up to the UX Brexit referendum, UKIP's Nigel Farage and other populists in Europe never lost the opportunity to point to SVP referenda, especially this 2014 initiative against mass immigration, to demand referenda all over Europe, which would give the people the power to decide and not the political elites. Here you have um, a poster from the, from the German AfD, which particularly insidiously quotes Willy Brandt, the first social democratic um, uh, chancellor in 1969 and an active anti-fascist during the war, who in his uh, first speech as chancellor said, we need to dare to be more democratic. So that they, that they rip that out of the context to use it in this way is pretty difficult. The highly controversial but effective media campaigns of the SPOK for this referendum and for others are indeed textbook examples for the whole of Europe's and not only Europe's populist right for calculated provocation, for pushing the boundaries of what you can say and what imagery and language you can use and for appealing to and mobilizing xenophobic and racist-based instincts. In the previous example, with the boots, I mean, it looks like an invading army, whereas the referendum was actually mainly uh, 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 directed against, uh, against highly educated Germans who were taking all the top jobs in German-speaking <coughs> Switzerland. The most famous or infamous example of the radical and racist othering of um, which the imagery and rhetoric of these campaigns employ is from the successful 2010 campaign for the deportation of criminal offenders of foreign nationality. So playing with the ambivalence of the black sheep, um, uh, the, the black other, but, but sort of the, the, the black sheep. And you see the normal parties, the other parties are meek and sheepish, whereas the SVP, you know, is the only one who dares to do something and kick, kick, the, kick the black sheep off the Swiss flag. Even more uh, pernicious is this video game, which um, I don't have the game anymore, but I played it a couple of times, um, which, with which the SVP appealed to the, to, to, to the younger voters who prefer to play games rather than to read uh, uh, lit uh, party literature. 
And the perniciousness <laughs> is the instruction is only keep the black sheep out. The white sheep are okay, we are an open and tolerant country. But as you move from level to level, the game becomes quicker and there are more sheep, both more black and, black, black and white sheep. So that the white sheep get in the way of you trying to push out the black ones. So you get really aggressive towards everybody who tries to come in. Um, I, I, I played this with sort of knowing all this, and, and I had that reaction, yeah? So that's, for me, this is a very, this seems a good sign of, of how they do it. With these posters, with these campaigns, they invoke a sense of a country that is threatened from the outside, needs to protect itself from the invasion of dark, dangerous, and overwhelming foreign forces. The final example <coughs> is the famous ban of minarets. Um, Switzerland had four minarets, so they said, that's really enough. Because minarets are a sign of the claim of Islam for dominance. They couldn't ban mosques because that would be against freedom of religion, so they banned minarets. So, um, the imagery and rhetoric employed here systematically is one of traumatic threats. The notion of trauma might seem entirely implausible in the Swiss context, given the unrivaled <coughs> political and economic stability of a country which had full employment and the second highest GDP in Europe for decades, has an all-party government in place since 1952, in which um, the so-called magic formula for decades even fixed the number of federal councillors for each party. How stable can you get? The most recent large-scale traumatic events the Swiss had to deal with were two invasions by Napoleonic troops in the early 1800s and the Sonderbundkrieg, a one month long civil war in 1847 with 86 casualties. <laughs> but there is, of course, the more recent trauma that didn't happen, the threatened, expected, but ultimately prevented invasion of Switzerland by Nazi Germany during the Second World War. How can we speak of cultural trauma, then, in relation to Switzerland? The Polish sociologist Piotr Stromka has extended the concept of cultural trauma to encompass defensive reactions towards wider effects of globalization, but also towards revisionist interpretations of a national heroic narrative and tradition, and revelations about the truth of the past that call into question such narratives. Its effects, Schwanka argues, can in certain situations amount to cultural trauma, particularly if the origins of this traumatic reinterpretation of the national narrative are coming from the outside and are perceived as being imposed. The recent Swiss cultural trauma that fits this definition and exposed its heroic national narrative as hypocritical whitewash was, of course, the revelations since the mid-90s about Swiss collaboration with Nazi Germany. The dealings of the Swiss National Bank with Nazi gold robbed from the national banks of occupied countries to keep warfaring Germany supplied with Swiss francs, dollars, and pounds, and the dormant accounts of Holocaust victims in Swiss bank safes to which the banks, under the cover of Swiss banking laws, refused access to relatives of Holocaust survivors. I do not need to recall, in America especially, the details of developments that started with the Eisenstadt Report of 1996 into economic collaboration of neutral countries and was settled in 1998 amid threats of a boycott of Swiss banks and companies after tenacious negotiations when the American lawyers who filed the class action suit on behalf of Holocaust survivor organizations and the World Jewish Congress finally reached a 1.25 billion settlement with major Swiss banks. This so-called global solution was accepted by all sides to cover all aspects, the trading in Nazi gold, the dormant accounts, and the all-important refugee issue, the systematic sealing of the Swiss border to Jewish victims of Nazi persecution between 1933 and 1944. The pernicious metaphor used at the time was, das Boot ist voll, the rescue vessel is full, pernicious, because if you, what you, happens if you overfill a rescue vessel, vessel everything, everybody dies. Um, the, 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 and I want to remind you that the, the, the red J in the Jewish passports was put in there at the request of the Swiss government mm -hmm. to make it easier at the borders to send the Jews back, as early as 1938. The Das Boot is full metaphor, of course, was much used by 
uh, extreme right-wing German splinter groups and also in the current refugee crisis uh, in the Mediterranean. Nazi gold and the transactions of, and the scandal of the dormant accounts were only the tip of the iceberg. Economic collaboration and arms manufacturing for the Nazis was part of the deal Switzerland made with Germany after being entirely surrounded by the Axis powers with the capitulation of France in May 40. In another breach of neutrality, the Axis powers were also being given access, they were given use of the transit railways across the Alps. So there, was, so there was really no need to occupy these crucial but hard to conquer nodes of infrastructure. The reality was that a neutral Switzerland that yielded to pretty much every demand that was more useful to the Nazis than an occupied one. The German general Jodl declared in 1943 about Switzerland, quote, it lives from us and we profit from it, unquote, while my Swiss mother-in-law, who lived through the war as a teenager, often quoted a popular saying among ordinary Swiss, quote, during the week we work for the Germans and on Sunday we pray for the Allies. So there was actually an awareness, there was an awareness very much of what was going on. I'm not going to further, further to comment or pass moral judgment on the opportunistic maneuvers of a government that did what it felt it had to do to protect its country and its people from, to, uh, and its people from war, invasion, and occupation. But I want to examine the reactions to when this political opportunism was exposed and became the subject of international controversy. The public reaction in Switzerland was very much divided and split the country right into the middle, a split that has persisted to the very day. A large part of the class politic and of public opinion was very defensive, rejecting this as they saw it unjustified attack on its moral integrity from the outside and suspecting utilitarian motives behind occupying the moral high ground. Paradigmatic was an interview by federal councillor Jean Pascal de la Mura, who argued the issue was not about historical truth, but about weakening and destroying Switzerland as a financial center, thus invoking century-old anti-Semitic tropes of conspiracy and financial greed. He infamously spoke of ransom blackmail and asserted, parents hearing certain people speak, I wonder if Auschwitz were in Switzerland a quote that he later tried to retract. He himself was not a member of the Swiss People Party, but of the center-right Free Democratic Party, but his views echoed and fed the kind of resentment that led to the subsequent rise of the SVP in green. So in 1995, it had 15%, um, um, pretty much what the uh, right-wing parties have in, at the moment in Germany and Sweden and Italy, then, in the middle of the controversy, it went on a par with the Social Democrats, 22.5, that's happening in Germany at the moment, and since then it's been up there. In order to appreciate that it is justified to speak of cultural trauma here, it is necessary, necessary for me briefly to examine how fundamentally this crisis affected the overarching grand narrative of Swiss national identity. So for some of these, of you, this might be all very familiar, but I, I didn't know, so I'm, I'm just uh, saying it anyway. The Swiss foundational myth goes back to the year 1291, <laughs> when in the federal charter or Bundesbrief, the three Swiss inner cantons in the Alps around Lake Lucerne, the so-called Urkantone Uri Schwitz and Niedwalden, guaranteed mutual support and allegiance against Habsburg rule. The historically unconfirmed Ridley, Ridley oath a meeting of representatives of these three neighboring valley communities on the Rütli Meadow near Lake Lucerne, in which they pledged to stand together, is linked to this federal charter. It is seen as the foundational act of the Swiss Confederation as the oldest democracy in the world, based on people's sovereignty, solidarity of diverse and largely autonomous communities who respect their differences but stand together against an outer enemy who is intent on taking their sovereignty and destroying the unique Swiss traditions and way of life. The Rutli Meadow is a central lieu de mémoire of Swiss national identity with annual celebrations there held on the National Day 1st of August. The national hero connected to this foundational myth is, of course, Wilhelm Tell, although he's actually from Northern Europe originally. The marksman of legend was forced by Gessler, the representative of Habsburg rule, 
to shoot an apple from the head of his son, son and is successful in doing so, but subsequently assassinates Gessler for his cruelty of making him do this, sparking a rebellion that frees the Swiss lands. The most well-known articulation of the Tell and Ridley legends is Philip Schiller's play of 1803, Wilhelm Tell, which gave the Ridley Oath its most famous <coughs> articulation, Wir wollen sein ein einzig Volk von Brüdern in keiner Mut uns trennen und Gefahr. One people will we be, a band of brothers. No danger, no distress shall suffer us. The Tell and Ridley legends are to this day enormously influential historical political myth as the political scientist Herfried Münkler defines them, grand narratives which constitute a resource for national identity, political legitimacy, and historical continuity. As foundational myth, the Rüttli Oath and the Tell legend are classic examples of, to quote Münkler, quote, promises of meaning which in invoking a past event become a guarantor for the future, unquote. Tell and the Rüttli myth have been and are today central stock in trade elements of the identity politics of the SVP. It regularly mobilizes Tell in its political campaigns in order to sell its policies as genuinely and quintessentially Swiss and in order to provide a political and cultural leg legitimation for their opposition to the EU. I'm not going to comment on this. Before and during the Second World War, the ideological preparation for war and even Swiss military strategy were based on these foundational myths which located the power to resist in the heart of the Swiss Alps. While Smith's Switzerland mobilized its militia army and positioned it at the borders, the commanding General Guizon developed the concept of the Reduit. In case of an invasion, the army was to retreat into the extensive system of bunkers in the Swiss Alps to defend the strategically crucial transit road and railways while allowing the Germans to fight a guerrilla war from the Alpine fortress, uh, sorry, while allowing the Germans to occupy the industrialized and populated central lowlands with the idea to fight a guerrilla war from the Alpine fortress that the Germans could not win. The poster for this talk, the bunker vault image of the poster, it's actually a Swiss banker, not in the Alps, but at the border, but the radiant golden aura that Amelia has given it catches the symbolic significance and mythical quality of both military bunkers and bank vaults for Switzerland beautifully, and of course also the aura of gold. Yeah. So uh, she, just, she just sort of got a week in well, precisely what I wanted to show. This was matched by a similar move in terms of identity politics, the so-called Geistige Landesverteidigung, the intellectual spiritual defense of the country. This official Swiss cultural policy sought to strengthen Swiss identity and the psychological readiness to defend Swiss independence by stressing genuine and distinct Swiss, democratic, pluralist, and federal values and traditions as being very different from those of the northerly neighbor. Given the close cultural ties with Germany, this wasn't always easy, and the promotion of such Swissness occasionally came perilously close to the blood and soul and mysticism of the Nazis. It, by the way, Hitler, Hitler's favorite play was Wilhelm Tell, until 1941 when he banned it because he was afraid it might inspire assassination attempts. <laughs> Uh, the Geistige Landesverteidigung also interpreted Swiss history as a whole as a permanent struggle against an outer enemy who is militarily or economically superior but morally and culturally inferior. To give visible expression to these continuities between the past and the present, General Guizon in July 1940 assembled his whole officer corps on the Rütli Meadow above Lake Lucerne for his Rütli rapport, which symbolically reenacted the oath of. After the war, the heroic tale of the fearless Swiss army and the ingenious tactics of the Reduit, which frightened the Germans so much that they didn't invade, was the official and dominant interpretation of Swiss neutrality during World War II, largely unchallenged, not entirely, but largely unchallenged, until it was imploded in the mid-90s. The other half of the population, of the Swiss population, however, saw the 1990s memory contests as a welcome opportunity to challenge the dominant version of collective cultural memory and finally to have a comprehensive and honest acknowledgement of historic responsibility and of the hypocrisy since the war. 
But then the fact that this long overdue debate was forced onto Switzerland from the outside was a sign of how frozen the identity narrative had become and how strong the national amnesia had been. Many writers, politicians, and public intellectuals used the 1998 jubilee of 150 years of the Swiss constitution to invoke the traditions of 1848, when the constitution was installed, for a more progressive identity narrative, drawing inspiration from a period when this new constitution made the Swiss Federal Republic the most progressive and liberal political system in an otherwise entirely monarchic Europe, and when Switzerland became a welcoming safe haven for political activists from all over Europe who sought and found political exile there. It isn't that the historical truth about Swiss collaboration with the Nazi regime was actually unknown in Switzerland up to the 1990s. Respected historians like Edgar Bonjour and others had extensively published on the issue, but their insights didn't resonate beyond specialist circles. Writers and left-wing intellectuals had also tried to raise awareness. There are prominent earlier examples of literary attempts to confront the past in this way on the slides. While most of these novels and plays caused some debate and some scandal, those, the effect was largely limited to the circles of the literati, who were widely seen as little more than Nestbeschmutzer, runner downs. Their authors, however, were calling for the kind of honest and critical process of self-examination that had begun in Germany after 1968 and had led to a memory culture that was open to acknowledging historical guilt and responsibility and that had integrated this into the national narrative. If you think of Lieu de Memoir in Berlin, you have the Brandenburg Gate, and directly beside that the Holocaust Memorial, and they belong together. There's, of course, also something problematical of, of, of being proud about how well you remember your victims. But that's a, that's a sort of quite a complex debate. The most outspoken and influential of these critics in Switzerland was the writer and professor of German at the ETH Zürich, Adolf Musch. In response to Delamuras' remark about Auschwitz, he published in 1997 an essay entitled When Auschwitz Lies in Switzerland, in which he attacks the Swiss special case identity and links today's Euroscepticism to the refusal to acknowledge collaboration, opportunism, and historical guilt. Musch, a strong advocate of EU membership, or of Swiss EU membership, bases his argument on the observation that Auschwitz was a foundational trauma out of which the European project which became the EU was born, and that it is therefore the dark center of today's common European identity. He asserts Swiss responsibility for Jewish victims when he says, we participated in the killing of a people and we made money from it. The sentence <coughs> Auschwitz is not in Switzerland after all, after all also means Switzerland is not part of Europe, and I leave you to read this. Musch was also among the first signatories of the Manifesto of 27th of January 1997, in which 4,000 Swiss intellectuals and public figures strongly criticized the defensive and anti-Semitic reactions of the Swiss banks and government, and demanded an acknowledgement of historical responsibility. He was also a strong advocate of the proposed Solidarity Fund of 700 million Swiss francs from gold reserves which with the Swiss government wanted to make further amends. However, that was defeated with a 50.3 majority by the people in a referendum in 2002. Again, these very narrow majorities. How does it come that in so many of these, uh, of these contests, the majority is so small? That's a very question for discussion. He was also a supporter of the Bergier Commission, an international research group of eminent historians, which the Swiss government tasked in 1996 with a comprehensive investigation on refugees, economic concessions, and gold transactions, which reported in 2002. Let me now finally turn to Thomas Hürlimann in the shorter part of my talk. He counts among the most important contemporary Swiss writers and is a provocative and often uncomfortable contributor to societal debate. He's the son of a well-known and popular Swiss politician of the center-right Christian People's Party, who was federal councillor and minister of the interior between 1974 and 82. His literature is a special case of life writing, as his family history is very present in his literary oeuvre. He's using fictionalized aspects of it 
to thematize the politics, history, society, and culture of modern Switzerland from a perspective which fuses the personal and the political. This enables him to situate questions of responsibility, moral failure, repression, evasion, guilt, and trauma in the most in intimate relationships, allowing for the collapse of historical distance. He was born in 1950 and is in many respects a typical member of the 1968 generation, subscribing to a liberal and left-wing agenda of change for a long time, while turning more conservative and nostalgic in recent years. Hölleman was raised in a traditional and conservative Catholic milieu of rural Alpine Catholic Switzerland, inclusive of eight years at the Einsiedel Monastery boarding school. These are his parents, obviously. He turned with 15 from altar boy to atheist and moved in 1974 for 10 years to Berlin, Kreuzberg. So quite a contrast to Zug or Bern or Einsiedel. His texts are a complex interrogation of the world of his upbringing, they thematize the collapse of the trash of traditional bourgeois milieu and its rituals and values. In doing this, Hurleyman blends the history of his country into his fictionalized family history and thus mirrors the hypocrisies and repressions of recent Swiss history in the taboos and silences of his own family history. The theme of personal trauma, is, of personal trauma, is central to Hurleyman's writing and runs through it as his breakthrough as a writer is linked to the central trauma of the Hurleyman family history, the death of his 20-year-old brother from cancer. His literary debut, the 1988-1981 novella Die Tessinerin, is about the slow and painful death from cancer of its female protagonist, yet the fictional text is interlaced with autobiographical reflections about the death of his brother and his reaction to it. Hurleyman's novels De Große Karte and Felsig Rosen offer in fictionalized form biographical portraits of his father and his mother, respectively, and in both of these, the terminal illness of the brother is central element of the story. De Große Karte was made into a not very good film with Bruno Ganz in the title role, which most of you will know better as Adolf Hitler in Downfall, Der Untergang. Um, the masterful autobiographical coming of age novella Fräulein Stahl <coughs> tells in a first person narrative about the summer spent in the world famous library of the monastery of St. Gallen, of which Hurleyman's uncle was the librarian. Actually, it caused a scandal because Hurleyman's uncle read the novella as a Roman acclaim and protested with his own published correction against what he saw as a distorted and insulting portrayal of himself and his eponymous housekeeper. <laughs> Berlingman's first play, Grandfather and Half-Brother, was one of the key texts which in 1980, well before the controversies of the 90s broke the silence about Nazi sympathies, Swiss anti-Semitism and the complicity of the population with the government's inhumane refugee policy. It is situated in a village at the German border at Lake Constance. Uh, Hurleyman's uh, fictionalized grandfather, identified as Mein Großvater Ott in the stage directions, and his parents, my father Hans Hurleyman and my mother Teresa Ott, are among the protagonists. In the play, a Jewish refugee, in order to be tolerated by the villagers, claims to be Adolf Hitler's half brother Alois, sent into Switzerland to prepare the country for the German takeover. The deliberately grotesque plot of the play turns on the villagers and especially the grandfather's ambivalence towards Alois, not knowing what to make of him, initially rejecting the Jew and sending him back, but then, when the German Anzig seems inevitably courting Alois, who manages to say, as he might actually be the high-ranking emissary of the Third Reich that he claims to be. There is a kind of burlesque dynamic going on in a Bakhtian sense, where the positions between perpetrators and victims are exchanged, which allows for a blurring of lines of questions of responsibility. The stage character, that is Hurleyman's father, is portrayed as student, who unthinkingly indulges, like so many others, in anti-Semitic prejudices, flirts with strongman politics, and systematically turns a blind eye to the Swiss breaches of neutrality. When the play premiered in 1981, <coughs> in the presence of Hurleyman's parents, it caused a scandal for three reasons. The taboo subject matter, the grotesque treatment of such a serious topic, and the critical portrayal of Hurleyman's family. The latter is clearly playing out a generational conflict between a rebellious artist's son and an overbearing politician father on the public stage, 
but it was also a calculated move by the playwright to increase the public interest in his debut as a dramatist. Another play of Hörlimann, Der Gesamte, The Envoy of 1991, deals in a more direct fashion with the Swiss fortification of history after World War II. This chamber play, based on documentary evidence, imagines the homecoming to Bern, the Swiss capital, of the Swiss ambassador to Berlin on V-Day, 8th of May 1945. The historical figure was Hans Fröhlicher, this gentleman, a Nazi-friendly opportunist who had, the, the, who had the morally compromising task to execute in Berlin the doctrines of Swiss. In the play, his name is Zwiegard, the expression of the schizophrenia of the Swiss position between the Allies and the Nazis. This is actually the Swiss embassy, to, the Swiss embassy today, right beside the chancery. This is a new part, but that's, that's the original part. And the Swiss embassy was the only building in that part of Berlin that escaped the bombings. Yeah. Why? Um, the Swiss embassy systematically bribed the local fire brigades with food parcels so that in case of a fire, they would come to them first. <laughs> Coming home to what um, he, Tsigar, imagines a triumphant welcome with the fatherland thanking him for sparing it the horrors of war, he finds himself instead silenced, marginalized, put under house address, and made the scapegoat. scapegoat while the military and General Guizon are put on the pedestal as the heroes who prevented the Swiss invasion. In a much quoted phrase, Zwiegard calls the Swiss a people of Tresoristen, Voltiers. But in German, Tresoristen and Terroristen, terrorists resonate very closely. Um, I give you a quote of, of Zwiegard, which I won't read out. In Fräulein Stark and 40 Rosen, which are both part of what I have described elsewhere as Hürlimann's family trilogy, he further examines the anti-Semitic climate in Switzerland and stresses the continuities between the war and post-war periods. In 40 Rosen, the protagonist Marie Katz is the descendant of a dynasty of Jewish tailors who migrated to Switzerland in the mid-19th century from Galicia. Hürlimann's mother's side, mother's mother's side were Galician Jews but he has almost no concrete information about that side of the family. Fritzi Rosen and Fräulein Stark, however, give an elaborate, fictitious, and imagined family history from the destitute immigrant Zender Katz to his son Seiden Katz, Silk Cat, who gains status and makes his fortune by providing the uptight ladies of the Swiss upper class with seductive lingerie, thus inserting a bit of sensuality into stiff and prudish Swiss Calvinism, to the father of Marie, an assimilated, non-practicing Jew who married a Catholic and runs a large and successful textile factory. To protect his daughter from anti-Semitic insults and attacks, the father puts her during the war years into a Catholic boarding school, where the nuns, however, have their own brand of anti-Semitism. They quote the mother superior, she's baptized, but she's Catholic, but she's a good pianist, but we need to keep her away from the organ as she's lacking the decisive requirement, the holy fire inside. Later, as the wife of the aspiring politician Max Meyer, Marie has to endure and even charm the very local dignitaries and party colleagues who stirred anti-Semitic resentment against her during the war years. Overall, her character, which is, which is in large part a portrayal of Hurleyman's mother and the sacrifices she had to make as the wife of a prominent politician, makes the point that her success as a charming, elegant, and sophisticated, but also patient and docile supporter of her husband's career, robbed of independence and agency, is in large part due to the bitter and painful lessons she and her Jewish ancestors learned in the assimilation to the conformism of Swiss life. There's also, of course, an echo of the history of women in her generation. In Switzerland, women got the vote in 1971, because the men had to agree to it, and they refused twice. In various ways that I don't have time to get into, the novel suggests a connection between her personal traumas, her own story of assimilation and conformism, and the collective traumas of the European Jewry through the centuries and in the Holocaust. Thus, as in other works, implicate in Switzerland with this history and working against the island metaphor and rhetoric. Do we have another five minutes? Uh, we are now at the middle of the 15 minutes for questions and answers. I mean, if you... Okay, well, I have, I have two things that I really want to say. So when do we finish? 
we have uh, 15 minutes overall. Oh my God, but we, but, but we started so, on the yeah, so we will have <laughs> <laughs> so, Keep going. In the autobiographical novella, Fräulein Stark, the young first person narrator, searches deep in the vaults of the St. Gallen Monastery Library for his own family history as one of the Jewish Katz family, which the family, after turning Catholic, suppressed. The library vault is, of course, a metaphor for this archive of collective memory, but it is also an allusion to the other Swiss vaults that hold dirty secrets in the Alps and other domains. Cats are a frequent and persistent leitmotif throughout Hurleyman's oeuvre and stand for an instinctual, sensual, individualistic, rebellious, and nonconformist attitude towards life, which challenges the rigid and sober Swiss mentality. In line with this, the protagonist's sexual and intellectual awakening his search for the secrets of origin and eros go together. The latter takes the form of a stocking desu and aroma fetish, which links him to his ancestors and especially to Zyrokats. On the one hand, the motivation for this is quite original, as the young boy in a kneeling position has to slide felt slippers onto the shoes <laughs> of female visitors of the famous library so that their stilettos do not harm the ancient, delicate parted floor. And Hurleyman actually had to do this as a boy while he spent the summer with his uncle. His fetishistic and voyeuristic adoration thus assumes a quasi-religious quality. The way, however, the novella links his sexual and intellectual awakening to his oversensitive and visually distinct nose about he, which the first person narrator is self-conscious, saw some critics charging Hurleyman with reviving and reinforcing anti-Semitic stereotypes of the predatory and lecherous Jew, others defending him, pointing to the difference between doctoral narrated voice and character voice. In the number of essays that interlace personal experiences with cultural commentary, Hörlemann also gave his views on the effects of the Swiss identity crisis of the 90s. And he does so throughout with the conceptual framework of personal and collective trauma. In his acceptance speech for the literary prize of the German Konrad Adenauer Foundation in 1997 with the title Über das Unheimliche, das aus der Heimat kommt, about the uncanny coming from the homeland, he uses a semantic proximity in German between heimlich, secretive, heim, home, heimat, untranslatable for belonging, heimelig, cozy, comfortable, and unheimlich, uncanny, which had already inspired Sigmund Freud in his seminal 1919 essay, the, the Uncanny, to discuss traumatic forgetting, repression, and the distorted return of the repressed, to argue that the taboos and secrecies around Swiss history turned his homeland and its narratives into an uncanny and uncomfortable space of alienation and defamiliarization, hence also the preponderance of grotesque elements in his work. He also expresses the hope and expectation that literature can help renegotiate and transform a traumatized cultural memory into a less cozy, less heimlich, but also less secretive, less heimlich, and therefore also less uncanny, unheimlich narrative. My final example is a directly biographical piece about the Nazi gold controversy, and it is in part situated on a US East Coast university campus, so I have to. In the fall of 1996, Hurleyman was Max Kade visiting professor at Dartmouth <coughs> College in New Hampshire, when the revelations about Switzerland's role in World War II started to dominate American news. Hurleyman claims that his colleagues in the German department summoned him to a sort of tribunal where they weren't interested in historical explanations, but demanded a personal acknowledgement of shame and guilt, which annoyed him and caused him to fall ill. Now, I, I find such undifferentiated moral indignation and insistence on collective good guilt by American Germanists very hard to believe. <laughs> and I'm only telling it because of the punchline that Hurleyman gives his story. He flees home to get treatment for his purulent lower jaw, which caused the fever, quote, the fitting tarnishment for dental gold robbers, unquote, as he puts it in identification with his country. At Zurich Airport, his mother welcomes him back with two bottles of Merlot and a homemade meatloaf, but he, in delirious pain and in a hurry to get to the dentist, stumbles on a downward escalator which eats up the meatloaf, spills the wine red as blood, and tears up his trench coat. <laughs> Fighting his way the stairs upwards while his coat is caught and gets mangled up in the moving escalator, he is rescued, he tells us, by, quote, men in long black coats with big black hats 
and long black side curls, Orthodox Jews, unquote. One of them stops the escalator, and another helps Willemann up with the words in broadest Zurich dialect, Hauptsache was in Wittert die Heide. The main thing is that we are back home. Hölleman definitely has a penchant for grotesque scenes and also for personal anecdotes with his own his meaning. How we are to interpret this little dramatic scene, which he prefaces with the remark, quote, you will not believe it, but I tell it anyway. On the one hand, he certainly wishes to emphasize that his resistance against the blanket condemnation of the Swiss and the acknowledgement of collective guilt is in no way directed against the Jews. He himself was one of the signatories of the 1997 manifesto mentioned above. He also reminds us that Switzerland staying out of the war meant that the Swiss Jewry escaped the Holocaust. His identification with his rescuers via the shared motive of the long coat, however, is problematic, as it in whatever tentative form parallels him as a self-declared victim of blanket political correctness with the suffering of the Jewish people. Even more problematic is that in differentiating between good Swiss Jews, which help you and welcome you back home, and bad international accusers, which attack you and put you on trial without listening, he uses and reinforces precisely the binaries of inside versus outside, us against them, that dominate the discourse of the xenophobic right with which I started. The essay from which this episode is taken, Les Prix de l'Escalier, was published in 2007. <laughs> And Hörlemann in recent years has become a cultural conservative who polemicizes against political correctness, is outspokenly Eurosceptic, and has turned more affirmative in relation to Swiss values and traditions. Be that as it may, in this piece, as in others, he uses strategies of life writing to complicate things and point to inner, inner dilemmas um, which allow identification and further scrutiny and analysis. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, we have about 10, 15 minutes for questions. So, and uh, we should take a step from in the back. Sure. Thank you for such an interesting talk. Um, your discussion of collective memory versus personal trauma makes me think of the literature on Latin America, of course, where there's an emphasis on collective repression rather than collective memory. And there's a famous Haitian scholar who wrote that silencing is not just holes in the historical record, but rather memories need to be silenced as one would silence a gun. An active process, in other words. So I'm wondering if there are clues in Harleman, if his, if his project is to make less uncanny and more revealed the Swiss landscape if there are clues about the previous process of silencing that he's then trying to undo. Like, because the preoccupation for historians of Latin America is what was the mechanism of silencing? How did certain histories get left out of national stories? Well, it certainly is something for me to, to, to look when looking at this photograph. I mean, I, I think some of the examples that I gave, yeah, no, they don't really, they don't really engage with the mechanism, with the mechanism of silencing. Yeah, I, I'm not sure, I'm not sure, but I, I, I will reread. Um, I mean, I'm rereading this stuff anyway all the time, so uh, I will, I will um, keep that um, as a perspective in mind. I grew up with grandparents who were from Zugin, St. Gallen, and I've long been fascinated with a line from uh, Kant that uh, from the crooked tree of humanity, nothing straight was ever fashioned. And, and, and it's listening to you, you know, I start to think about why that line resonates so much for me is because I grew up in a culture in which there was no recognition of the crooked tree of humanity. The, the, the literalness, the lack of nuance, uh, seems so powerful to me, so, so deeply embedded in me, and I have a, a lifelong struggle against that. And uh, Herleman seems to have uh, found a way out of that. Can, can you talk a little bit about uh, his ability to see both sides of the coin rooted in, in what I experience as, a, I'm, I'm an anthropologist, so I think of this in cultural terms, a culture that has such profound difficulty with contradiction and nuance. 
Yeah, no, that's 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 a that's a lovely line from Kant, of course, and and one that I think uh, is, is is very relevant for a lot of the of the memory work that is going on in breaking up uh, monolithic narratives, um, and 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 one way of doing that is precisely. Uh, looking at at, uh, at at where sort of the crooked tree of humanity is can be found in your neighborhood, in your family, in your in your relationships. Uh, there is a there is a famous collection of uh, of, of, of um, there is a famous book about about uh, second generation and third generation memory of, of Nazi Germany in Germany called Opa war kein Nazi. Grandfather wasn't a Nazi. Um, to, to say that sort of yes, you acknowledge you acknowledge the historical responsibility, the shame and guilt, but not really if you can inside your own family. You have very different narratives between the personal and and the collective. And I think one of the things that uh, that Hörlimann is doing by sort of locating these little stories within his own family is um, sort of breaking that up. Yeah, although his father wasn't wasn't a Nazi, but he was certainly sort of an overbearing. Father, uh, father figure, which, which for a lifelong um, makes him struggle with that. Yeah, but um, um, so he looks at generational experience in, in in that light, and I think in general the reason why literature is often has been in Germany, has been in Switzerland, the first to question these uh, monolithic identity narratives is because of the ability of literature to accommodate paradox to sort of portray humankind in all its complexity, to, to, to sort of uh, point to the, to, the, to the general and the symbolical in the very, very individual personalized story. That's why it's such a great, that's why it's such an important and crucial medium. I would say that, of course, I have to make a case for my own profession. <laughs> Understood you correctly, you're saying that the majority um, in Switzerland is it, it, it very close. It's a small majority, mm -hmm. and this has been going on for how many years? Well, I mean, in, in all of these, I mean, in, in these these referendum, I only went back to the referendum of the of the uh, since 2010. Okay. But already the Schwarzenbach initiative was quite uh, close. Wasn't but it was in the 1970s the first the initiative to put quotas on immigrants when they were desperately needed for the economy. That was already very close. So, so that's part, uh, part of the kind of question, which is that, you know, you talking about the Swiss, it makes them sound as, you know, most of what you quoted was in German. But because, you know, Switzerland is also uniquely has three mm -hmm. languages, right? I mean, there's West Coast, the French, the West, and the Italian. Mm -hmm. So I'm just trying to figure out how how much the identity politics here ha is, is German, and how much of it is Swiss, and if there's, right? Yeah. I mean, the Italians, at least in the 70s, there were, you know, Italian movies about how the Italians in Switzerland yeah. were all second classes. So, yeah, it's, it's I, I, I didn't really, have the time to go into that, but it's a country of three or four languages and three cultures, and um, um, and and consistently the French speaking part is more progressive, both with the big cities. Um, there is the famous Rüsti Grave, the, the, the sort of um, what's it called? Divide. Well, the, sort of the the, 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 the cultural the, the cultural divergence between the Romandie and, and uh, German-speaking Switzerland. But the German-speaking Swiss are three quarters of the country. So they are, uh, they are, uh, they are the dominant uh, in terms of identity politics and in terms of, of, of sort of driving the political decisions. They are the dominant, they are the dominant part. And Switzerland praises itself as the model for Europe. Look, we live together so well. Uh, well, they, they live, um, one Swiss writer said, well, the, 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 the language groups and cultures in Switzerland get on so well because they stand back to back of each other. Yeah? So they prop each other up, but they also ignore each other. They take very little interest with each other. I mean, we, we could talk for hours about that, but, uh, but there's time. So, so um, yes, it, it, it complicates the narrative, and I've, I've given you 
I mean, it was, for example, in the Second World War, it was the question was um, who becomes general uh, of the command of the of the army, and they chose a uh, because the, 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 the German-speaking general was a very open Nazi supporter, Wille, mm -hmm. and and um, and so so in 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 the political sphere there is always a, a balancing act, a balancing act going on. But this this anti-immigrant um, strain is mostly centered um, in the Germans. Well, but the Ticino, the Ticino well, has a very true. strong equivalent to the Liga. Right. So, so no, you so can't. It's a loosely, can't really, uh, no, it's a fact. Yeah, yeah. Really I'm just trying to figure it out. Yeah, yeah I have a, a two questions. I have a little bit maybe some so first one is about your use of anecdote in the in your own talk. Like you, you make that aside about how it was the Swiss who asked for the red J in the. German passport, so it's and then the other anecdote about the um, about the Swiss embassy in Berlin, how <laughs> they tried the the fire department to to um, yeah. and I mean that's a very external perspective on Swiss history, I guess, or Swiss complicity, or whatever you want to use that, or Swiss attempts of insulating themselves against harm that befalls the rest of Europe, um, and. Um, <clears throat> And um, so, so I was wondering, is, is, um, would there be something like an equivalent to that in your own talk in Swiss writings? Like, I mean, if you think about German literary texts, mm -hmm. there are, you know, from that generation of Hülemann, there are authors who are less, who wouldn't end with this happy Swiss reunion at the end of the Orthodox Jew and the other protagonist on the escalator, but, but where the break is much, where the criticism is more, brutal or frontal and where I think the authors don't necessarily adhere to this cultural identity and history that they are part of. Whereas it seems to me as in mm. Hüdemann it's still mm. you know he, you know it's still a literary project that very much adheres to the cultural continuity of his country mm. and family. And so, so would there be other authors who who step more outside or who mm. try to step more outside? Yeah, that's a really, really I mean, in the, in, the, in the more recent, the more recent generation is um, is is less overtly political than than his generation or or Bush. But for example, Lucas Bertus in Hundert Tage. I don't know whether anyone is familiar with that. A novel about uh, Swiss uh, implication in the Rwandan genocide. Um, that is, in, in many ways, a much more radical text. Um, but if, if, you, if you are asking about, about uh, not just sort of the, 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 um, the political position taken, but the aesthetic position taken, which I suppose interests you more, and you're right there. I mean, uh, well, uh, yeah, yes, yeah, no. Um, this, the, 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 the experimentation with with sort of aesthetic forms that that, that deliberately and radically um, uh, challenge and undermine the coherence of a narrative that's not very widespread. In fact, um, you have uh, you have in in in, uh, in parts of Hülemann's work you have more of that which I didn't really go into, but that's where it's sort of his 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 is uh, a frequent arrays into the into the surreal and into the grotesque um, um, uh, tries to achieve that and also sort of um, uh, uh, blurs the line of what is uh, uh, taken from from uh, autobiographical or from memory and, and is fictionalized. So he's very skillful in in in. in Blurring that line, but the Swiss contemporary literature is not very uh, experimental in in, uh, in in terms of aesthetic of, of an aesthetic shattering of, of, of narratives. I, I think I have a related question about um, Hülemann's aesthetic approaches, and I was especially interested in your comments on his use of the grotesque, which seems like a kind of fraught trope to. Uh, bring to bear on the redress of cultural trauma because it relies so often on a kind of um, 
primal reaction, um, stereotyping, um, othering. Um, how do you evaluate his use of the grotesque and in so relationship? How, you, how do you? How would you evaluate his use of the grotesque in relationship to what you're articulating as um, his project to redress cultural trauma? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I think that's. I mean, this is work in progress. Yeah. I'm, I'm, um, I'm working on a book on it, and this is one of the questions that I keep asking myself. Okay. Um, uh, and I'm not. I, I don't really have the answer. Because you are right. I mean, uh, um, his his falling back onto stereotype as part of his aesthetic arsenal is is not unproblematic, and that needs to be that needs to be spread out. And that's why I closed with that uh, yeah. with that piece with which I closed. Um, um, uh, and, but. Uh, it, it is also, it is also, in other instances, quite successful in uh, in, in in unsettling the reader and preventing mm -hmm. from um, sort of getting too comfortable in seductive narrative. Because he's a very very good um, mm -hmm. uh, teller of stories mm -hmm. in the in the in the sort of realist tradition. Mm -hmm. He mm -hmm. just um, um, after I arrived here, I learned that, that, that two days before I, I flew to America, he published a new 550-page novel <laughs> called Heimke, A Homecoming. So I was absolutely terrified. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, and of course, read it uh, while I was here. But it's actually, it doesn't, it, it doesn't um, touch yeah, on the, the topics of my talk. It is, uh, but it is, it is very large text and takes the and takes the reader on a really, it's, it's a sort of, it's a, bit, it's a bit in the mode of the tin drum, mm -hmm. uh, 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 um, a, a picaresque novel, um, on a quest, quest for origins, it's, an, it's, an, it's a variant of the Odyssey, um, it's, it, it, it negotiates the borderline between life and death, it takes its, uh, it takes its um, departure, from a near-death experience that really one actually himself had an accident, which of course harks back to the topic uh, related to his brother that I mentioned. And, um, and it's, it's, it's a very puzzling, but also a very brilliant piece. And, and this, this tension between the seductiveness of the narrator and the, 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 the desire and intention of the author to unsettle the how that really works, that, in, that warrants and demands further investigation. That's one more question. Very well. Thank you. Uh, there's much to, <coughs> to continue with, but uh, I'm wondering about the sort of closure of the family as a, as a figure that bears the burdens of national trauma and its repression and so on. Um, how that works, or if there are examples or cases in everyone's work or in some associated um, uh, discourse, what, when figures other than family members bear the burdens of truth and reconciliation, in other words, because it does seem like, a, like potentially, uh, I, I'm asking basically whether there are moments in which the family, or whatever, the, the figurative unit that's being uh, interrogated, is, is more clearly on the side of something like Gesellschaft and Gemeinschaft, which is where many of the problems seem to surface. When, when, you know, are there characters in the novels who didn't grow up in libraries like that, uh, you know, who, who speak of a different Switzerland uh, and that might have been affected differently by the histories that you weren't, that you recount, and so on, and are put in some relation with, with the, you know, high bourgeois uh, political family in which he, he's taking part. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's that's a that's a really that's that's a really that's a really good question. Um, and uh, and I, I think that is that is actually a problem uh, with with his over and that's what he he um, he draws very much on his own privileged background and that allows him sort of insights into the mechanism. Of, of, of the political of, of, the, of political life, mainly in the Rosicata and also in in Rosen. But 
but but um, but he doesn't he doesn't really go very much beyond his last uh, last uh, uh, minion. Um, another book that I mentioned briefly that I showed there also at Walters Die Zeit des Fasans, which is also in a sort of high mm -hmm. familiar in an industrialist family, which was but it was very much and very directly implicated with collaboration with the Nazis, with an attempt to uh, to overthrow Swiss democracy and install the sort of this kind of sort of strongman politics that uh, that which is which is one of the most discussed novels. Uh, was doing that as well, but there it is, it is a much more uh, of a sort of societal panorama where the, where the, where the, sort of the, 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 the workers of, uh, of, that, of that factory also get points. Yeah? So, so no, he doesn't, he doesn't really get very much beyond, um, beyond his own class perspective. That, that was your point. Partly, and also the, the closure of the family is a figure for nation mm. of any other people. Thank you. I think we're our time is up. I thank you very much.